Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's now time to begin our service on this season of rebirth. And so we begin our service this morning uh, with the singing of the hymn, And Now the Green Blade Rises by Sheila Kaloran. Thank you, Sheila. As we join together in worship this morning, we pause to recognize that the land where we gather has been known for thousands of years as a Miskwichi Waskahagan, meaning Beaver Hills House, a traditional meeting ground and home to many Indigenous people, including Cree, Sotu, Dene, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. In today's world, our church building and our Edmonton homes are located on Treaty 6 land. In this wonderful world of online worship, we come together from across Treaty 6 and many other places. Regardless of location, we commit ourselves to the creation of equitable, just, and compassionate relationships with the Indigenous people of our home communities. For those of you joining us from a distance, I invite you to enter your Treaty territory or location in the chat box. Good morning and welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation, one of many UU congregations meeting across the continent this morning. My name is Dean Wood and I'm your service leader this morning. I'm really pleased and we are really pleased to welcome as our speaker, Reverend Audrey Brooks, a longtime friend of Westwood. Audrey is a UU community minister with the Unitarian Church of Edmonton and has held many, many leadership roles uh, in the community and in the Unitarian world. Some examples are she's been inter she was interfaith chaplain, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She's the spiritual counselor with Camp Firefly LGBTQ+. Presently, she is Canadian ambassador for the UU International Women's Convocation, which we will be, she will mention later today. Welcome to Audrey, to our congregation. Our musicians this morning are Sheila Kaloran and Rebecca Patterson. Numerous volunteers make the Sunday service possible and we thank them and our musicians for their contributions. In particular, we want to thank, and I want to thank, Alara Stefaniak Godet and Bill Lee, our techie wizards who are making possible this service in a virtual space. Our chalice lighting words this morning are adapted from a work by Reverend Monica Jacobinson Tenason. Welcome. What you bring, who you are, enriches us all. We say welcome to your joy, your hope your pride. We say welcome to your grief, your fear, your anger. And the parts of you that are not ready to be seen and heard, welcome to them as well. May this time together be a blessing.
The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished tradition at Westwood, whether we gather in, per in person or in a virtual space. We pause, reflect upon our week, and recall the milestones, the joys, concerns, and sorrows, the changes in our lives, as well as those who need healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. In our virtual world today, we can share our joys and concerns by typing them into the chat box at the bottom of the screen while we listen to Pachelbel's Canon in D performed by Sheila. I light one final candle for the jo all the joys and concerns that remain unspoken in our hearts. Please join together in reciting our Westwood affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. While we are meeting in a virtual space without the passing of collection plates, we remember that volunteer service and money are the essential elements that sustain our congregation as our church home. We thank everyone who has generously pledged their time and talents and their resources for this church year. During this time of virtual church gatherings, contributions can be made by check, in the mail, or by e-transfer. Further information about doing that is available by clicking the donate button on the Westwood homepage. So now please sing along with, with the uh, offertory song. From you I receive, to you I give. Now it's time to turn 
the platform, the podium, the pulpit over to Re virtual pulpit over to Reverend Audrey Brooks for her sermon, A Geography for the Spirit of Easter. Welcome, Audrey. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to, to talk with you today. The infinite blessing of this time of the year, of course, is that we're always in the middle of creation. And in ancient mythology, of course, that what Easter was all about. The mystery of creation hidden somewhere in the snow and the blizzards that covered the northern lands resulted in something like this picture of the Snow Queen in her sleigh being pulled by the reindeer. Uh, who would believe that out of the ice cube world that we live in, that life could actually happen? I think this was illustrated in the beautiful hymn they started the program with today. Um, the, the grains of wheat in, in the earth waiting to come forward. Or under a frozen uh, blanket of snow, things could happen. In ancient geography, there were no witnesses to explain how this happened, how the snow could melt away, or there could be any kind of hope. And still every year spring comes and with it new growth and new life. Yes, the earth and all that are in it are in this cycle of change. The indigenous people as listed in our program this morning knew about this and this uh, cycle and marveled at it just as we do now. Being one with the earth, the sky, the wind, the water and the fire lived in harmony with continuous creation. Some would say that we came too far in all our technology. Some would say that the real geography of the spirit was left behind, that was left behind for us in earlier times of just being forgotten in the technology. Others say we have to move forward and get with the new cycles and leave the old stuff behind. Some say we have to give up on rabbits and Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and try to fit them in with the religious uh, symbols, which doesn't really work. There's a paradox between the Christian observance of Passover, uh, crucifixion and resurrection of a savior and the Wiccan goddess Oster, whose symbols are the rabbit and the egg, among other things, as you can see in this slide. There's an owl and some other things in that picture. Um, others say that it doesn't matter because children love to celebrate the coming of spring and Easter eggs and they like to hug rabbits, and so on. Some say it's rather odd to celebrate the murder of a prophet whose father could have found a better way to sort things out with humanity than to demand such a huge sacrifice. Some say, in the first place, it doesn't make sense to blame this whole thing on a woman who ate an apple or some such thing in the Garden of Eden. Others would say the Easter story is a powerful one, where it teaches people about duty, service, and sacrifice for the good of the larger the community. It's also a way to explain the reality of human suffering and the other big realities of the nature of evil and the reality of death. I think even Unitarians have questions about things like that, suffering and death, for instance. It's, and it would be nice if there was a supernatural power that could figure out a workable way to improve the outcome somewhat. In every generation, there are religious and secular leaders who challenged injustice and who ultimately paid a price for speaking out. And the words of Jesus of Nazareth, prophet, Jew of color by the name of Yeshua ben Yehuda, were reflected in the Beatitudes recorded in the Christian scriptures. Now here was a man, a special man, who was a true sayer, who spoke out against the corrupt religious and bureaucratic institutions of his time. He called for equal treatment and care for all people, for those who were poor, for those who mourn, for the sick in body and mind, those who could not speak for their rights, those who cried for justice and for women's rights, 
those who were persecuted and for the peacemakers. That's a big list. So it's not hard for me as a humanist to agree with his message and it, as part of my spiritual geography, a way of mapping my journey. By knowing other women and men have walked it before me, beside me, ahead of me, and as teachers and mentors. Many of us could say a similar thing. By inspiring each other to be good people, to work within our own human sacredness, to develop our UU faith and spirituality, we do make a difference in the world. We speak from the same heart as those with deep faith and from other faiths. The difference is that we are free from restrictions of dogma and tradition. We live in a great mystery of who we are, where we come from, why we're here in the first place. We don't have to get there in a sense that we have to accept certain sets of rules and rituals or to force ourselves into structures that do not fit our beliefs. We trust the legitimacy of our personal faith, our personal search, and the worth and dignity of our person and our choices. I like the idea of those old maps, and here is a picture of one of them, where unexplored areas were left unmarked, but the words, here there be dragons, were inscribed. Careful navigators would stay away from those places. But uncharted waters are often the only places people can navigate. And where they came from was even more perilous. If the dragon is a symbol of the monsters lurking in the unknown, it is also a place where exploration occurs. The dragon has a treasure to be sure, and it is a pile of gold and jewels, which are symbols of power. Yet this is my favorite dragon. It holds its most precious possession close to its heart, and that is its egg. The universal symbol of all life and all creation and all possibility hidden in the realm of the unknown, part of the geography of search, of risk-taking in uncharted places, for justice and sustenance for both body and spirit. We don't mind a little bit of the golden jewels thrown in there. Which triggered me to think about the egg that sits on the Seder plate at a Jewish Passover. It's not a dragon's egg to be sure. You can see it, a little thing over there. But it sits with the other elements on the Seder plate. All the elements are historic historical symbols of the slavery of the Israelites in Egypt, the liberation and flight from the armies of the Pharaoh who ultimately changed his mind about letting them go. The Seder plate has bitter herbs on it that remind the Jews of their lives of, as slaves. And there is a bowl of salt water there to represent the tears they shed, a mixture of nuts and fruit that represent the mortar which held bricks together. There are green vegetables to promise sustenance and hope. And there is the egg, which represents potential for all life. The Seder plate is a geography, a map that is a reminder of where the Jews have been and, the expect and to remind them of the experiences they had in Egypt are still with us today. This year, I was fortunate enough to be part of a Seder Passover on Zoom held by Shulamit Levine Hillman and her wife in Amsterdam, Holland. They are members of the Unitarian Universalist International Women's Convocation that meets twice a month online. I joined this unique group of UU women in March when they went online for the first time due to the COVID pandemic. I noted that in addition to the elements I described on this first Seder plate, Shulamit and her wife added an orange, some olives, a banana, a tomato, and some fair trade chocolate. Very unusual, so I thought. 
During the service, Shulamit drew parallels between the exodus of the Jewish people and the refugees across the world who seek asylum, who are wandering from place to place, looking for safety and food. They experience racism, violence, turn it away from places of refuge. There is, is a geography of treacherous journeys with more than 70 million people this year, this last year, on the move over unsafe waters and lands. So when we dip bitter herbs in the salt water of tears, we dip them for the Rohingyas and we dip them for the, the uh, other people who like the people of Exodus were cast out into the waters and onto the land, trying to seek safety and to preserve the lives of their families. They experience all of the terrible things of treacherous journeys. And then when we have to see pictures like this, we know that we have to say, do more than watch the media. I talked about the Rohingya man who walked six days to avoid military capture in his native Myanmar before he came to the Naf River, swam to Bangladesh and made it to a refugee camp. We dipped our bitter herbs in the salt water for the Syrian mother rescued from the Mediterranean waters and that little boy that was washed up on the shore of the sea. And for the Somali and Ethiopian refugees who are cheated by the smugglers who dump them into the ocean. And now we ask, why put an orange on this Seder plate? The orange is placed as a symbol of our recognition and acknowledgement of sexual minorities in our communities as our family members and as our friends. By welcoming all with open hearts, we celebrate diversity and freedom this is quoted from the Washington Congregation for Secular Humanist Judaism, as are some of my other comments. Why are there olives on the Seder plate? Because for slavery, I'm sorry, because for slavery, slavery truly to be over, we must end our oppression of the other. Those of us who are part of the Palestinian support groups understand that none of us can be truly free so long as we are standing as occupiers on other people and take from them their right to provide for themselves and their children. One of the stories that moved me to tears was listening to a Palestinian man whose olive grove of over 300 years was bulldozed to prepare for a Jewish settlement land that belonged to his family. A banana was a special treat Ellen Curdy's father, Abdullah, brought to Ellen and his brother, Gallup. Every day, the more he gave, brought a banana. The boys and their mother, Rianne, drowned on their way to freedom. So we add the banana to remind us of refugees who take such great risks to escape persecution. And you can see the little, little boy in the picture there and, and trying to bring them onto these boats to save their lives. Fair trade chocolate and cocoa beans are grown under standards that prohibit the use of forced labor. They are included in the Seder plate to remind us that although we, as part of the Jewish total world family, escaped from slavery in Egypt, but that is still very much with us today. There are so many ways the stories could be told for that one. The tomato represents migrant workers who are brought here to work at planting and harvest our fruit and vegetables, but who are exposed to poor working conditions and overt racism in their housing and in their care, absolutely terrible. At the beginning of the sermon, I said we are in the middle of a continuous creation, the mystery of it hidden somewhere in the wilderness, 
and yet out of this ice cube world, life happens. We're always evolving through all of these seasons as illustrated here. Life happens, always evolving, ever moving forward, one truth, one change at a time. Even as Unitarians, we stumble and then we pick ourselves up and keep going, gaining momentum as we learn from the stories we share, from the places and people all over the world who are our relations, wherever and however they live. The places where everything is connected, though sometimes imposed on us through a world that is now sitting on our proverbial doorstep. Our holidays, such as Easter that we're celebrating today, the Passover that we celebrate, give us time to stop and reflect that as Unitarian Universalists, we are both one and we are both many. That our mission is love, our race is humanity, and our faith is in each other. Blessed be. Now, just before I leave you, I would like to encourage women to consider finding out more about the Unitarian Universalist International Women's Convocation. And the information is here. This organization works to empower women and girls all over the world. I first met them at one of the UU General Assemblies and got to know Sophia, I can't say her last name because it's Hungarian and unpronounceable to me. Um, I found that I am now part of an extended women's group, an extended family that are part of my UU life. Each, uh, every second Tuesday, eight o'clock in the morning, we get together sometimes 60 to 70 women from all over the place, including Sylvia, from uh, originally from Rwanda, uh, who is now in Bangladesh. Uh, she and her husband started a Unitarian uh, uh, gathering there, they were persecuted and so had to leave. And they are being sponsored by the Halifax Church. So I got to speak with her several times, uh, women from Paris, from Holland, from Spain, from just everywhere you can think. And of course, a lot of American people. I think these are really, really powerful and free and really, really working women. Part of the Unitarian uh, delegation at the uh, United Nations as well. Marilyn Shinye in Halifax and I are the two Canadian ambassadors, the only two. So it would be nice to have other women of like heart and mind to join us there. So thank you again. Uh, blessed be your day. And I'll be here to answer questions. Thank you so much, Audrey, for that powerful and stimulating UU message at a time of Easter and Passover. Uh, Audrey, as she said, she will stay in the main room when we break for coffee if you'd like to have further conversation with her about the messages from her sermon. Our closing hymn this, today is number 61, Lo, the Earth Awaits Again, again played and performed by Sheila.
as our service comes to an end, we, I'll read the benediction and extinguish the chalice. These words are adapted from Reverend Maureen Killoran. No matter how weak or how frightened we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may we each do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong, be connected, each day act, so we may be a little more whole. So now it's time for our coffee hour, our virtual coffee hour, of course. All of this is temporary. Someday we will be together again face to face.